Good, let's start. First of all, welcome to this free webinar brought to you by Conmotion. This webinar is part of a series in preparation for the upcoming conference that will happen in Milan on June 14th uh, about blockchain and crypto values. So I hope to see you all there. In the next uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we will try to answer those two questions. Sorry. The first question is, what is stored inside a block in a blockchain and what is suitable for? And what is worth to store inside and what is better to store outside? Because we talk a lot about blockchain, but sometimes it's not very clear what is capable of storing or not inside. So, first of all, let's start saying that there is no such a thing as a blockchain. Blockchain is an umbrella term describing several technologies that were put together and assembled in a way in order to make them work. Um, and from a historical point of view, of course, the first successful implementation of those technologies that we call now blockchain was Bitcoin in 2009. And today we will focus on the two most uh, relevant open and uh, open source implementation, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Ethereum was the second successful one in 2015. So, when we talk about all those technology, we talk about three main components, cryptography, game theory, and peer-to-peer -peer networks. So we use cryptography in order to sign all the information that we are going to store inside the blockchain. And we can use different kinds of cryptography and different level of cryptography. And we use the game theory uh, in order to set up some rules about how to build consensus about what will be the next block. And we use the peer-to-peer -peer network in order to propagate all the information that uh, each node um, preserves and so on. So depending on how you mix those three components and the underlying technologies, you may have different flavors of blockchain. Um, Talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum, we are in the upper left uh, quadrant. So they are permissionless and public, which means that you have no ask. You have to not to ask anybody the, um, uh, to be part of the network. You can join the network freely. And every node has the same rights on the network. So it's open and require no permission in order to join. You may have different kind, different uh, other different kind of blockchain uh, flavors, but today we will focus only on those two. So what is a blockchain? Actually, it's a chain of blocks kept together by uh, some very clever cryptographic uh, um, functions uh, in order to um, ensure that the um, blocks are chained in the right way and nobody can change this uh, chains and so cryptography is used to ensure that nobody can alter the, the content of a block after uh, it has been mined and blocks may have or may have not actually uh, limited storage size this is of course from bitcoin and the other very important thing is that blocks are chained in a sequential way so there is a starting block, which is the, which is called the genesis block, from which a chain starts. Of course, uh, at some point in time, there may be some diversions of this um, uh, sequence of blocks, but the, um, the way that consensus is built, the game theory is used inside blockchain, ensure that at some point, usually quickly, uh, all the inconsistencies between different kind of um, blocks and chain uh, are resolved into a sequential stream of blocks. And of course, the other important thing is that in order to be public and permissionless, um, all the blocks should be propagated to all the peers of the network. The more the peers, the most um, secure and unforgeable the um, blockchain is. So let's 
take in consideration Bitcoin, the very first implementation of a successful uh, worldwide blockchain. So what's inside a block? Inside a block, uh, Bitcoin block, there is actually a bunch of transactions. And uh, this very simple picture is very important because it tell us, tells us few key points, very important key point about how Bitcoin build transactions. So first of all, a transaction, if you want to spend some money, so if you want to pay someone some money, you can have you have to take one uh, previous transaction that holds Bitcoin and compose a new transaction. And this is called the input part of the new transaction. Let's say that we have a transaction A holding some Bitcoin and transaction B holding other Bitcoins. And we want to pay uh, 0.007 Bitcoins to someone else. So given the fact that transaction A has 0, 0, uh, point, 0 0.005 Bitcoin and transaction B 0 0.003 Bitcoin, we need to bring them together in order to have the enough amount of money. Actually, uh, we see that we have more money than the money that we want to transfer. So we have 0 0.008 and we want to transfer it only 0 0.007. But you have to keep in mind that the difference, the balance between input and outputs uh, determines also the fee that is going to be paid to the miner. So actually, when a miner mines a block, it receives two rewards. One reward for the moment, until all the Bitcoin are exhausted, is in form of Bitcoin. So the very first transaction will be a reward for the uh, simply a reward for the miner. But all the other transactions present in the blocks will compose the actual fee paid to the miner in order to repay his efforts uh, in terms of electricity and computing power. And this is automatic. You, you don't have to explicitly say how much you want to pay. Uh, so you have to pay really um, a lot of attention on the balance of the transaction because all the difference between your input and your outputs will be paid will pay be paid automatically to the miner. This is how the miner is incentivized to mine to spend money, and uh, energy, and computer power. Okay, so let's go to a deeper detail. Um, of course, we you can explore the blocks through a bunch of block explorer, and we will go in to do it soon. And you, from a um, website like this, you can gather basic information about the blocks. I think this is the information regarding a single block and or uh, about transactions contained in the block. Here we can, say, we can see that inside this block, the very first transaction is a special one with no input, which is called the, uh, the coin base. So each block has at least one transaction inside the very first which has no input and has only output for the miner who has uh, mined it. So in this case, we pay 12.95 uh, uh, and something Bitcoin to the miner. And then after we have a normal transaction made of one input of 10 Bitcoins and two outputs. Of course, as you can see, one of the two outputs is the same address as the input. Why? Because yeah, if you want to pay less money to someone else, you have to keep in mind that if you don't make your change again against your address, you will lose this, uh, this change. Uh, it will um, flow uh, into the minor um, fee, as you can see downstairs. Okay, but this is a very high level representation. Okay, so if we want to go deeper and see actually what the block is, um, it's better to install something else. For example, you can install on your computer the Bitcoin Core implementation, which is the reference implementation in the Bitcoin world. Here you can compile and you can use these very basic um, in commands in order to extract information. Um, so let's say that we want to see what's 
actually inside a block. First of all, we will take a look at the very first block of the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. So this is the Genesis block. As you can see, is a block made only of just one transaction and exactly of just one Coinbase transaction. So let's say that we want to see what is actually li look like. So here uh, I have no terminal because you need to use a bit. It's a bit more complex to have an online system here. We don't. I don't have an actual resources on this laptop. So this is the actual output of my um, terminal. So first of all, we issue through the Bitcoin uh, command line interface. We can do also programmatically you know, this kind of things. We ask for the block of eight one. So blocks are ordered starting from one in Bitcoin, from the very first block, and we get back an hash. This hash is the fingerprint of the block. So we can um, refer to the block by hate or by hash. Once we got the hash, we can ask for the real content. And what we got, in a human readable uh, format is the actual content of the block. Okay. Um, what is important to, uh, to understand is that in Bitcoin, blocks, okay, uh, and transactions are in a very, um, are encoded in a very defined way. So, for example, this is a specific, this is the specification for the block header, the one that we are looking here. So uh, when we look at the block, we look at a stream of bytes, usually represented in uh, hexadecimal format, hexadecimal format, but we can interpret the, um, the content of the header following the specification. So there is a version indicating which kind of version of the block we are looking at. Uh, of course, there is a previous block, a pointer, an hash pointer uh, signed in a crypto um, cryptographically in order to ensure the chain. Uh, there is another uh, fingerprint, which is the Merkle root, which is the fingerprint of the transactions contained inside the block. As you can see, every hash is very small. It's just 32 bytes long. And that's a key point uh, in all the, uh, this kind of implementation. Then there is a timestamp indicating when the block has been mined, has been created. And then there are other information, the bits and the nuns, uh, which are um, referring to um, the um, game theory target difficulty of mining this block. And uh, at the end, we have the transaction count. So this same information is visible here, okay? So, uh, which is the actual information encoded inside the uh, block uh, binary representation. So as you can see, inside the block, there is also an array of transactions. So if we take this, which uh, this is the hash of the transaction, and this is the signature of the list of the transaction, the Merkle root. So um, in this case, we have just one element, so the Merkle root is the same. Uh, but again, if we look at another more complex example, we can see the difference. Uh, the key important uh, point here is that the Merkle root ensure that we can verify the content of the transaction list and that the hash, the transaction, uh, can be verified against the content of the transaction itself. So uh, the hash is very representative of the content. And given the hash representing the content, we can ask Bitcoin client to get the transaction raw content. So this is the actual content in hexadecimal format of the transaction. And we can also see how long it is. In this case, it's 268 characters long. But of course, this is not very practical to <laughs> read. Um, Again, also the transaction as an header 
and then a more complex structure. So the transaction basically is the implementation of the, the picture we saw at the start. So you have a bunch of inputs, you have a bunch of outputs, and you have other information regarding the cryptography, um, the cryptographic signature of both. Uh, we don't have time to go in deeper detail, but again, um, we can see, for example, and we will focus on the real content of each input and each output. So the transaction header is just a container, um, like the block header is a container of transaction. The transaction header is the container of all the inputs and the outputs. Let's go back. So once we ask for, we ask the Bitcoin client to decode the raw transaction, passing it the binary encoding of the transaction, we get back this structure, which is actually the same structure that we see in the specification and also in the web browser. So this is a very special transaction. This is the first transaction, the only transaction in the very first Bitcoin block. So it's a coin bane sequence. So there is no input actually, and there is only one output. Here we have to take uh, a look at the script pub key. So uh, we will see the same thing also in the input in the following examples. Uh, the point is that you have to sign the transaction saying, okay, I'm the owner of this money and I allow this money to be transferred to this uh, output address. But um, we are also to sign the output in a way that only the receiver can unlock it. So this is called the script pub key, which is a script in a language, which is the internal scripting language of Bitcoin, which is not Turing complete from a technical point of view. Uh, it means that you can uh, predict exactly how uh, long is the script and how it will take to compute the script itself. Of course, the very basic script is just the unlocking uh, of the value based on a private key of the receiver. So it's very simple. Uh, what, you say, what you see here, the op check sig is actually an operator in the language. So this is the value you are passing to the operator. And this is the operator you apply to the um, uh, value is um, almost similar to Fortran is a very peculiar language, but it's very compact and so on. And compactness is very important in Bitcoin, we will see later. Why? Because the only in the miners have can't build blocks larger than one megabyte. So the, since one of the a uh, very important stream of revenues for a block, aside from the Coinbase, is the total amount of fees they can collect from transaction. So miners are incentivized to choose to, um, the most uh, relevant transaction from this point of view. So, and the more money they can get from the fees applied to transaction, the less, the more compact are the transaction themselves the more they can stuff inside the block. So that's why in Bitcoin is quite unusual to have very long uh, unlocking scripts, but we can have more sophisticated ones as well. So if we want to go deeper inside a transaction, we can actually repeat the same operation. So get a new row transaction and the code the transaction of a typical uh, payment so this is actually um, taken from a very um, important book, which is called Mastering Bitcoin, the second edition in this case, is an example encoded inside of the, uh, the blockchain. So I strongly uh, advise you to read this book because it's very well written. And in this case, we have finally an input. So this is not the first transaction in the block. Uh, the use case is uh, Alice that wants to um, buy a cup of coffee from the Bob's Cafe. So Bob cafe, uh, Bob's uh, Cafe is the receiver and Alice is the sender. So we have in this case one input, OK? 
Okay. Again, we have also a script saying that, okay, this input has been signed by uh, Alice, thanks to his, uh, her private key, and is uh, she signed all the transactions, all the inputs, uh, all the outputs inside this um, transaction. This is the all um, uh, key you, say he, you see here. And then we have two outputs. One is for Bob, and the other is the change uh, going back to the um, wallet of Alice. So uh, as you can see from the very first block in, blo in blockchain, the normal way of expressing and locking script based on private key nowadays is uh, done in this way. So using a bunch of operators. But again, we can see that, for example, in this case, the actual size of a transaction is a bit larger than the first one we saw, almost twice as long. So the first transaction, the very first transaction was a special transaction, just 256 um, characters long, and this is almost double. So again, the more complex is the script. For example, you can have a multi-signature script, so allowing, allowing uh, people to sign uh, for transaction in order to, for example, if you have at least two out of three signing for a transaction, making it valid, so it's quite long script. And of course, you can have more complex script as well. When inside um, blockchain uh, browser, web browser, you see uh, an output script that is not passable, it's because there is a more complex script than this one, okay? So, The other key point is that aside from Coinbase, all the inputs must be linked to a previous output. And that's why you have also this information. Okay, before going to Ethereum, we'll see just one last thing about Bitcoin and its colored coin. So before all this token mania um, exploded, uh, last year uh, in Ethereum, and of course Ethereum is the reason why we have a lot of tokens nowadays, and that's a good thing. Uh, also, there was a, also an, a basic implementation in, of what was called colored coins, for example, open assets, which is not so used anymore, but just to give an idea. So what, you, what else you can store inside a block, inside a transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain? With some tricks, you can store some information as well. Of course, again, you are enlarging the dimension of the transaction, so you have to give the right balance between input and output, and also in a, in a way to incentivize the miner to choose your transaction. Otherwise, your transaction will remain in the cache of the pending transaction for a very long time. So in this case, the trick is to create a transaction with three outputs. One output, which is valued zero, which has no value, use this special operator, which is op return, that uh, is interpreted by the, mm, the engine inside Bitcoin in order not to evaluate nothing. Okay? So the actual bytes following the op return uh, may encode some information. In this case, in the open assets format, they encoded the very four byte was the OA prefix identifying the open asset token. And the following part was an URL pointing to some other site. So in this way, if you build a wallet capable of understanding the format you are encoding inside this, you're capable of doing colored coin bitcoins. Of course, there are several constraints uh, in Bitcoin in order to store very large information inside this. And we have to say that tokens really uh, started with Ethereum. So it's time to go back to Ethereum. So Ethereum is a blockchain, but was developed with a different kind of mindset and scope. First of all, the content of the block is not a, a simply a transaction. 
but it's a state transition function. So the idea behind block, um, Ethereum is that Ethereum is a, a global worldwide um, singleton, which means that is you can imagine Ethereum like a big virtual machine, which uh, a state, and each transaction is actually a function that enables the state to change from state zero to state n. So it's not only about sending money uh, to addresses. It's also about calling functions, uh, retrieving output from those functions, storing a new kind of state given the execution after the execution of the function. So it's a bit more complex structure. So, and in this sense, uh, it's encoded in a different way. Okay, of course, you can use Etherscan to get a glance of what's inside uh, a block or a transaction. We will be there in a minute. But, and you can install Ethereum in several ways. This is a way to, of installing Ethereum with the Go implementation uh, for command line operations. But the very first point is that as Bitcoin was built with very simple structure, the structures inside the block in Ethereum are quite complex and they required uh, a new way of encoding them. So they end up with this RLP, which is a way of encoding values, as you can see, single bytes, strings, uh, of some size or bigger, and lists. In this way, the, de um, the decoding of the transaction, the transition state, and the block is quite complex and more complex than in Bitcoin because we have to um, store more information. So let's take a look at what's inside a block uh, header in Ethereum. So there are, of course, almost the same information that are in Bitcoin plus some very specific ones. Um, the um, hashing function, the um, cryptographic function is different. In Bitcoin, you have a, an SHA2 derived function. Here in Ethereum, you have an SHA3 derived function. But at the end, all of them um, allows you to um, build a hash, uh, validating, representing a signature, representing a block, for example, like in parent hash, or again, a tree of, a tree of transactions, like in transaction root, sorry, in transaction root. Um, here we have to, we have, oh, aside from transaction, we have these receipts, uh, U, uh, root. Uh, we will go there in a minute. And the very most, the very important thing is about the gas. So, like in Bitcoin network, the currency is called Bitcoin or BTC and is a way of incentivizing miners to do their job. Also in Ethereum, you have um, a currency which is called the Ether or ETH. And of course, an Ether is issued uh, every time you mine a block. But since the engine, the virtual machine, um, is capable of uh, running Turing complete functions, which means that you can run loops, you have very complex if conditions, um, you can't um, predict uh, in advance how long it would take to compute a function. So you have to introduce some limits. And uh, Ethereum has introduced another kind of currency, which is called gas. And it's used to say, okay, I want to run this function and I'm, I want to spend at max this amount of money expressed in gas units. And if the function is taking longer than the allowed amount of gas, please terminate it. So it's a sort of pay as you go or run as you go. So the more complex is your function, the more content you want to store inside what is called a contract, the more you have to pay for the execution. And if you don't have enough gas, your function will never be executed. Or if you ask for free execution, your transaction will remain in the cache for a very long time and eventually some, uh, at some point will be probably uh, computed, but you don't know when. So again, 
uh, we have a block he header that is a very compact way of representing all the content inside a Ethereum block. And for example, if you want to explore the gas and how much it costs to execute a function, you can use, for example, it, uh, Ethereum gas station website, which is very interesting. And you can see how it's going to cost probably your function. Uh, the very first unit of execution, I mean, the minimum amount of gas you have to spend is 2,000, um, sorry, uh, 21 thousandths of gas unit. And of course, there is a rate of exchange between gas and ether. Um, it's quite complex uh, computation. We don't have time to go in deeper details, but keep in mind that you have to pay as you go. So the Ethereum transaction is similar to a Bitcoin transaction in the sense that um, it collects information about two kinds of transaction. You can have a contract creation transaction. So you want to store your function inside the Ethereum work, uh, virtual machine, global virtual machine, in order to uh, execute uh, it in a later in time or repeatedly. So this kind of transaction has the common fields um, plus a new fields which, is, which contains the actual code of your function. A very important field is the nonce, which is a different, which has a different meaning in respect of the nonce seen uh, from the game theory um, in the header in the block header, because the nonce is um, a sequence um, identifying all the transaction belonging to an address, and it's used to actually execute all the transaction in a sequence. So, for example, if you generate from an address a, a transaction of nonce one and then two and three, and they arrive in different order to the miners, the miner, for example, the miner is going to receive uh, two before one, uh, will mine two just after it has received or it has been mined also the one. So it's a very sensitive um, information. And of course, you can have also another kind of transaction, which is a message call transaction. So you have store your contract, you want now to execute your contract. And so you can you have to issue a new transaction with this field, data field valued, with the name, let's say the name of the function you want to call inside the contract, and eventually some data you want to pass to the function as well. Um, the Last information inside the transaction is what is called the transaction received or logs or events. So each time a function um, is invoked, uh, the function can store some output, for example, a return value or um, some kind of logs inside this other structure, which is called the transaction received. And just to be clear, you have to pay for storing the contract. You have to pay for executing the message, um, some kind of gas, and you have to pay also to store the transaction receipt. Um, the price is different, so it's cheaper to store in information inside logs than inside transaction, because actually it's only the real transaction, not the logs that are stored inside the block. And the contract can also only access the information stored inside the blocks, not the logs. But you can use the logs uh, for retrieving information from an application point of view. So everything you store inside the Ethereum block has a different kind of cost. Uh, this approach is, of course, due to the fact that you are executing functions, not simply storing balances between input and outputs like in Bitcoin. So, the message is that you can store much more richer information as long as you have enough gas. Before going to stats, let's take a look at the very first Ethereum block. This is the Genesis block of Ethereum. Uh, what we see here are the same information that we see um, on, on the specific reference. We can, say, we can see that Inside this block, there are a lot of transactions, actually. 
this is different between the Ethereum Genesis block and the a Bitcoin Genesis block. And if we, okay, we can go inside one of these transactions, but what I want you to show, and of course, due to the fact that it's quite complex a structure, it's more easy to um, display it using a web interface or a more complex interface. So um, just to finish this um, part about Ethereum uh, and um, approaching the end also this uh, webinar, uh, we can see here the logs. So for each transaction, you are looking at the transaction of a specific contract. So this is a contract. These are all the transactions belonging to this contract. So all the calls that has been, um, all the function that uh, has been uh, invoked for this contract. And here in the events, you can see the log of all the logs generated by each call. And as you can see in the specification, um, for each transaction log, you can have, you have a, actually an array of logs uh, identified by a topic. So you can have multiple topics. And for each topic, you have an array of data. Of course, we don't know how to interpret this data in the sense that it's the contract that knows uh, what is uh, what uh, it's going to store inside the logs and of course the application that wants to, to interact with the contracts need to understand which is the behavior of the contract for example we can see the code these are the function in solidity language which is a far bit more complex language than the language used inside bitcoin and this is a reference of the functions that can be called by the uh, external applications. So an application calling one of these functions will have to retrieve or could retrieve the output inside the logs and apply the um, required pattern in order to understand, for example, if this is a text, probably not, or is a number, probably yes, we don't know, or an address, we don't know, okay? We have to go deeper inside the code and the contracts uh, and the contract in order to understand how to interpret this log. But, as you can see, in Ethereum, you can store very more complex things than in Bitcoin. Of course, now we have to understand, is it possible to say that one is better than the other? It depends. So, if you look at stats, for example, we can see, uh, you can see in the graph on the left side of the, um, the screen, that, for example, that the sides of the blockchain is growing faster for Ethereum than for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the blue line and Ethereum is the red line. Bitcoin is around 250 something gigabytes of disk used at the moment and Ethereum is growing uh, towards one uh, terabyte something more as of May. Uh, so depending on how many transaction you want to store, how many things you want to store inside the block, the, mm, the, the, complex, uh, the complete size of the blockchain can grow at a very expensive rate. So why I'm saying this? Because we, we, we said at the starting of this webinar that we are, going, we are addressing a very specific kind of blockchain in this talk. So the permissionless and open blockchain, which means that you have to allow people to run nodes uh, in a sustainable way. So I'm not talking about mining in this case. Mining is a completely kind of different thing. We are talking of the resource um, necessary in order to just run a node and store all the blockchain. So why you want to store a blockchain inside your computer? Because you want to have control on the validation phases. You want to trust um, a verified um, blockchain and not trust someone else so in order to depend on some risky external authority and on the left you can see the sides of the block so you can see that if um, blockchain uh, bitcoin is almost one megabyte nowadays and ethereum has very smaller blocks and this allow uh, ethereum to have a much higher rate of transactions as you can see almost three times um, more than Bitcoin. So the balance of all those things, how 
big should be the nodes of your blockchain network? How big is the block and how fast or uh, slow it propagates through the peers? And how many transactions are you capable of doing inside your network? Um, determines the kind of flavor and the possibility of the uh, blockchain you are offering or you are using. That's a very important thing. So I would like to finish um, saying that, okay, say, so you want to use a blockchain. And for me, these are the questions you have to pose uh, and you have to find an answer for them in order to see if the, the blockchain you are going to use is the right one for you. For you. So the first question is, who can set or change the rules of the protocol and establish which is the next uh, real next block? And who runs the nodes and pay for them? Because nodes are required not only for mining, but also for validation. So if they are very expensive, who are going to pay for them and how? And of course, who validates the blocks and at which cost? And the last, but the more important, given this talk, is who can read, but more important, even more important, who can write on the blocks of your blockchain. And this is all. Thank you very much. And I think that we have a few time for questions. I uh, suggest you to read this uh, article from Wired, which very um, appears three years, a few days ago, about all the things that at the moment people say that blockchain is supposed to fix, and most of them probably are not. So it's time for questions. Thank you very much. You can send your question through the go to webinar. Any questions, any doubt, any curiosity? Okay, so we have a question from Lorenzo. Cianciaruso, what's the mechanism to access the blockchain network if there is no central entity? Oh, um, it's peer-to-peer -peer technology. So it means that when you fire up your node, what happens is that the nodes uh, search for broadcast request, request to the network and see if there is other there are other nodes available and establish a connection to a, a bunch of those nodes. So uh, the number of connections, number of peers is of, um, almost uh, limited in a sense. It's always limited. You don't connect to all the peers of the peer-to-peer -peer network, but just to a bunch. And you establish with them a relationship in order and a contract that says that um, every time that one of the node connected receive a new block from a miner, it should propagate the block to the other ones. Or if you are a miner and you are connected to other peers, once you have a valid and validated block, you have to um, propagate the block to the other peers. In this way, the topology of the network is always changing because nodes may appear and disappear, uh, but it's basic peer-to-peer -peer technology. I hope to uh, answer this question. So what about... Of course, um, uh, the question I think is from Luca Grande is what about more Bitcoin by routine payments? So, the, um, of course, there is a huge debate about the fact that Bitcoin has a very slow transaction uh, per second uh, capability. This was by design. I think they were that um, uh, Natasha Sakamoto was right about this. So, in Bitcoin, you have a new block every 10 minutes and each block can't be more than one megabyte uh, inside so you can pack inside the block 
and you can process in a specific amount of time a very limited number of transactions. So nowadays, there is a very interesting technology which is called, which is called Lightning Networks. Um, on top of Bitcoin and probably on other uh, soon other blockchains that allow to establish trusted um, channels between nodes and route in a very clever way through those nodes uh, a payment request. Uh, the idea is that you use the blockchain for the most valuable part of the microtransaction. So, for example, let's say that you uh, always take coffee from block. Um, um, a specific cafeteria and you want to pay this cafeteria with Bitcoin. Instead of asking the Bitcoin network to store every micropayment, you just ask the Bitcoin network to say, okay, I want to pre-allocate an amount of money like you do in a prepaid card. And through a very complex, I don't, we don't have time to explain it, but through a very complex way of dealing a contract between you and the cafeteria, you can start consuming this amount of money between you and the cafeteria in a safe way and then store only the balance at some point. So in this way, you have very low transaction requirement inside the Bitcoin network and you have very high transactions inside, uh, in a more simplified way, inside the Lightning Network. So I'm a big fan of Lightning Network, as you can see. And the very other important things about Lightning Networks is that the routing, so let's say that I want to pay something to a specific cafeteria, but I'm not connected. My node is not connected to the cafeteria. It's connected to a friend of mine. And this friend of mine is connected to another friend and so on. And after 10 friends, actually one of them is connected to the cafeteria. The Lightning Network allows you to send, to say, I want to pay the cafeteria, passing through all your um, chain of friends, with a, with a high level of security and anonymity. So it's very interesting. I think that's the future. Okay, I think I've responded also to Luca Grande. Any other question? Okay, let's see. Anyone? Okay, I think that we can finish this webinar. Thank you all for your participation and I hope to see you all at the conference in Milan. Bye.